Let's now begin our discussion with the analysis methods for reinforced concrete beams and one-way slabs. Chapter 8 in ACI 31805 contains the general requirements for the analysis of any concrete structure. The first step in the frame analysis is the determination of the service gravity loads and lateral loads, such as wind and seismic. The general building code under which the project is to be designed and constructed is to be used to determine the service loads, lateral loads, and all other applicable loads on the structure. ASCE 7, Minimum Design Loads for Buildings and Other Structures, is referenced in the latest edition of the International Building Code, which has been adopted in many jurisdictions throughout the United States. For a specific project, however, the governing local building code should be consulted for any variances from the IBC or ASCE 7. Methods of analysis for reinforced concrete structures are presented in Section 8.3 of ACI 318.05. Factored loads are service loads, which are multiplied by the appropriate load factors, given in Section 9.2. These load factors will be discussed later. For the strength method, an elastic analysis is used to obtain bending moments, shear forces, and other reactions. The assumptions that are specified in Sections 8.6 through 8.9 may be used in such an analysis. Let's briefly go over those assumptions. The first assumption has to do with the member stiffness. Ideally, flexural and torsional stiffnesses should reflect the degree of cracking and inelastic action that has occurred along the length of each member before yielding. Determining these quantities, even in a relatively simple frame, is very complex, and such a procedure is not efficient for use in design offices. Thus, simpler assumptions are required to define flexural and torsional stiffnesses. In braced frames, it is common to use one of two sets of assumptions. In the first set, the gross flexural stiffness values are used for all the members. In the second set, the gross flexural stiffness is still used for the columns, but for beams, half the gross flexural stiffness of the beam stem is used. For frames that are free to sway, a realistic estimate of the flexural stiffness is desirable and should be used if second-order analyses are carried out. In such cases, guidance for the choice of flexural stiffness is given in the commentary, section R 10.11.1. Selection of the stiffness factors can be greatly simplified by using tables 2-7 and 2-8 in PCA's Simplified Design publication. The stiffness factors are based on gross section properties, neglecting any reinforcement. Whether it is necessary to consider the torsional stiffness in the analysis of a structure depends on the type of torsion present. In the case of equilibrium torsion, where the torsion is required to maintain the equilibrium of the structure, torsional stiffness must be considered in the analysis. In the case of compatibility torsion, where members twist to maintain deformation compatibility such as you would find in a typical continuous system, torsional stiffness may be neglected. More information about this is presented in the last section of this module. Let's now move on to the second analysis assumption, which has to do with span length. When determining bending moments in frames or similar types of continuous construction, the span length shall be taken as the distance between the center lines of the supports. In the case of beams built integrally with the supports, which is typical in cast-in-placed reinforced concrete frame construction, it is permitted to design the beams for the reduced bending moments at the face of the supports. An acceptable method of reducing moments at support centers to those at support faces can be found in the PCA publication Continuity in Concrete Building Frames. The third analysis assumption deals with columns. Columns in a frame are to be designed for the most critical combinations of factored axial loads and bending moments due to the applied loads. The design of columns in a frame is not discussed in this module, but is covered in detail in the column design module. The arrangement of live load on a structure is covered in the last of the four analysis assumptions. These requirements will be illustrated by using the generic building structure shown. The following assumptions apply only to gravity load analysis and not to lateral load analysis. The first assumption is that the live load is applied only to the floor or roof under consideration.
for example, if we were interested in designing the beams on the second floor, the live load need only be applied at that level. The second assumption is that the far ends of the columns are assumed to be fixed for the purpose of analysis under gravity loads. Once again, if we are interested in designing the beams at the second floor level, the columns above and below that floor level are assumed to be fixed, as illustrated. In typical situations, the arrangement of the live load on the structure that will cause critical reactions is not always readily apparent. The engineer is expected to establish the most demanding set of design forces by investigating the effects of live load placed in various critical patterns. It is permitted by the code to assume that the arrangement of live load is limited to two combinations. The first is factored dead load on all the spans with full factored live load on two adjacent spans. The second is factored dead load on all spans with full factored live load on alternate spans. These loading patterns will be investigated for a three span frame. In the first loading pattern, the live load is applied on the exterior spans. This pattern produces the maximum negative gravity moment at supports A and D, and the maximum positive gravity moment in spans A, B, and C, D. In the second loading pattern, live load is applied on adjacent spans. This produces the maximum negative gravity moment at support B. Finally, in the third loading pattern, the live load is applied to the interior span only. This pattern produces the maximum positive gravity moment in span BC. As an alternate to the frame analysis procedures that were just covered, section 8.3.3 permits an approximate method of analysis to determine bending moments and shear forces in continuous beams and one-way slabs. Such approximate methods are not to be used for pre-stressed concrete members because they do not account for the secondary moments that occur in these members due to the pre-stressing force. The approximate analysis method can be utilized when all of the following conditions are met. First, the structure has two or more spans. Next, the spans are approximately equal, with the larger of the two adjacent spans not greater than the shorter by more than 20%. Third, the loads must be uniformly distributed, and the unfactored live load cannot exceed three times the unfactored dead load. Finally, the members must be prismatic, that is, they must have a uniform cross-section throughout the span. The coefficients for determining the positive moments along the span are illustrated here. These coefficients are multiplied by the total factored uniformly distributed load, W sub U, and the square of the clear span, L sub n squared. Coefficients for the negative moments at the faces of the supports are illustrated for the case where there is a spandrel support and a column support. Note that when calculating negative moments, L sub n is taken as the average of the adjacent clear span lengths. Coefficients for the shear forces at the face of the supports are also shown. These coefficients are multiplied by W sub U, L sub N. The approximate bending moments and shear forces obtained from these coefficients give reasonably conservative values for the stated conditions. Section 8.4.1 states that redistribution of negative moments in continuous flexural members is not permitted when this approximate method is used. Provisions for moment redistribution when the approximate method is not used will be discussed later.